So let's do this one. Unless you've been you you know you've been reading already in the textbook or um, you might not know what the formula is. There is actually a way to kind of guess at it. Uh, the one way to guess at the formula would be to uh, ex use this relationship that we covered in uh, Monday's class that the resistance can be related to the resistivity by a length over area of the, the conducting thing. And you could use this to try to guess at it, but I want to spend most of our time in the circuit. So let me use the uh, circuit problem solving tools, uh, Kirchhoff's rules, to figure out, um, figure out what the equivalent resistance here is. Here, do you see um, do you see any junctions? Yeah. How many junctions do you see? Two. You see two junctions. All right. So let me label them. And um, by the way, all I'm saying now will is summarized in the uh, handout that you see. But I want to give you some intuition for the advice I'm giving you in that handout. So I have two junctions. Um, all right, so I think I'm going to be using junction rule then, right? So I need to add up um, all the currents coming into a junction, add up all the currents going out of a junction, set them equal to each other. That would be one equation I get. And junction rule applies to each junction. So there's a junction rule that applies to this, and there's a junction rule that applies to th this. So um, before I can write down my junction rules, Anything I should do, do first? Yeah, I'm kind of hinting at it, but um, I need to label my current. So here, the, this current was the one same current throughout the entire circuit. Yes? Right? Here, can you say this current is the one same current throughout the entire circuit? No, once you come across things, this junction, you face a choice. The current could go up or to the right, which means it splits off. There is going to be a current that goes here and current that goes here. So let me label them I1 and I2. And I guess I'll keep using the same symbol I. Good. And once you enter each branch and within the branch, it's the same current until the, until it meets another junction. And within this branch, it's the same current until it meets another junction. That? All right, so that's the first thing we had to do. We had to label the currents in each of the branches so that we can actually write down this equation. Uh, let me write down junction rule. And since I see two junctions, let me use both of them. So let me label the junctions as junction one and junction two. Let me write down the junction rule equation for one. Um, so I add up all the currents coming in. What are the currents coming in? Just the I, and it's the way I have it labeled. So I is equal to the currents going out, I1 and I2. I1 plus I2. All right, so that's one equation. Let me get myself another equation here. Um, so equation two. Um, by the way, um, how many unknowns do you see right now? Really, only two? Three, what are those three unknowns? Yeah, they are all unknowns. <laughs> I have unknowns in terms of other unknowns. <laughs> um, so I'm looking for at least three equations, which is why I'm looking for as many equations as possible. And in fact, um, this is the area where portable TA and I differ. Portable TA will tell you, Using these two rules, come up with as many equations as possible. Uh, I don't tell you that. I tell you the exactly correct number of equations. Not one more, not one less. Um, and this is really why. So let's say I'm going for as many equations as possible. So I'm going to use all my junctions. So I use the junction one. Let me use junction two. OK, what are my currents coming in? Yeah, I1 plus I2, what are my currents going up? Yeah, the I is the current that's coming out here. Hey, haven't I seen this equation before? Yeah. So if you include both of these equations into your system, you have created a dependent system of equations. 
meaning solving a dependent system of equation gets way more complicated than solving an independent system of equation. So the advice I'm giving you in circuit solving that's also in the handout is geared towards avoiding dependency. So I'm going to do what I need to do to avoid introducing the second equation which doesn't actually add anything. So this is the advice that I give you in the handout. When you see the number of junctions in your circuit, the number of times you should use the junction rule is the total number minus one. Leave one junction unused. So that's what you see here. When you have two junctions, the very last junction you use is guaranteed to give you an equation that's already dependent on your system of equation. So here it's easy to see, they are the exact same equation. When you have more junctions, sometimes it won't look like any of the other equations, but it will be dependent in some other way. So, uh, you, so that's why I want you to use the junction rule first. Uh, it's uh, the easiest one to say, all right, if I have two junctions, I can use only one, one of those. If there's three junctions, I can use only two of those. So you know exactly how many times you used to use it. Doesn't really matter. Yeah, I mean, I could have used this junction and kept, you know, kept this and got rid of this one. Yeah. So as long as you leave one unused, you will be guaranteed to have an independent uh, system of equations. Independent, but not enough. I only have one equation. I need two more, at least two more. So where do you think I can get those two other equations? Yeah, the loop rule. The, this is the rule that I haven't used. So here's the benefit of having used the junction rule first. How many times do I think, do you think I should use the loop rule? Two. two. And I need to use it exactly twice. Uh, I want three equations. I don't want four. I don't want two. So I need three total equations. So now I have, once I have used the junction rule, I have the benefit of knowing, okay, I need to use the loop rule exactly this number of times. So I'm going to try to find the two loops here. And uh, let me do, you know, two. So the general advice I would give is um, pick the loops in a way they overlap with each other as little as possible. As in, you know, you would not do this. So you wouldn't say, OK, I pick this loop, call that loop 1. And I mean, I'm sure no one here will say, OK, having picked this as my first loop, for my second loop, I'm going to pick the exact same loop. Like, would anyone here do that? No, right? <laughs> you know not to do that. And um, what I would tell you is when the situation gets more complicated, um, the equivalent version of is that you want to avoid the overlaps as much as possible. The loops will always overlap a little bit. Let me pick this as the loop one. And for loop two, let me pick it this one. So you know, starting from this point, going around this way. So these two loops overlap a little bit. They share the same branch here. Some overlap is fine. They are going to have to overlap. But um, I guess this is an illustration I could give. If I picked, addition, in addition to having picked loops one and two, if I pick a third loop that goes this way, it's going to give you another dependent equation. Can you see that? Why the third loop would give me a dependent equation? Look at how the third loop overlaps with the first two. Does it completely overlap with the first two? Right? So, you know, if I imagine drawing this, what color? Yeah, I'll just draw it and not use it. If I imagine going over this loop, say this is my third loop, for every part of the branch I'm going through, has it already been covered by the other loop? Yeah, so that's the sense, of, that's what I mean by overlap. And when you have a situation where the, the branch has been covered by your loop, it has already been covered by another loop already, then this is not going to give you any equation that, it's going to give you a dependent equation. So the advice I give to you is, you know, define your loops in a way that minimizes overlap. So, I, so with these three loops, I could have used loops one and two, or one and three, or two and three. Just not all three, because if I do that moment is when there's complete overlap. Uh, so, so okay. So let me not use loop three. I'll use loops one and two. So okay, that's beginning to sound promising, right? I wanted exactly two equations, and there will be exactly two equations that probably will give me exactly what I was looking for. 
So let me relabel these loops so that I don't confuse my numbering system. Let me label this 2, because it'll be giving me uh, equation 2. And let me label this loop uh, 3, since it'll be giving me equation 3. And let me erase this other junction that I'm no longer using. All right. <laughs> um, so my equation 2 comes from this loop. So I'm going to go through the same thing I did here before. I imagine starting from here, and as I go across each element, I figure out, all right, what is the change in the voltage? So for the loop number two, I'm going to first go over the battery. That's going to make me voltage change of plus V0. And then I'm going to go across the register. And my voltage drops. Yes, everyone agrees? OK. Uh, minus I2, R2. And I, then I come back to the same point. So that should add up to 0. All right. So that seems fine. It didn't introduce any new unknowns. So hopefully the last equation also looks fine. Uh, the loop number three. So I start at this point. As I go across this register, does my voltage increase or decrease? So I start at this point here. And I go across this register from right to left. How many people say voltage increases? How many say voltage should decrease? So at some point, we will summarize this in a sign convention. But here, I want you to gain the intuition that as you go from here to here, voltage is increasing. In fact, that's the only way you can be consistent with what you say here. Because here, you said going from here to here, voltage was decreasing. So if you are going the other way, it must be increasing. And in the sign convention that we are going to come up with, it will have to do with the direction of path you are going relative to the direction of current. When you are going with the current, then your voltage is decreasing. When you are going against the current, then your voltage is increasing. For the register, it's a register specific rule. So, as I go across this register, uh, for loop number three, it's going to be actually plus I2, R2. And then as you go across here, this time with the current, going across R1, it'll be minus I1, R1 is equal to 0. Okay. I have three equations, three unknowns. I should be able to solve it. All right, so let's just go through it and do it. Uh, so actually, this um, uh, do I want to talk about this too much? Uh, I'll deal with the definition of parallel later. I'll just go through and solve this as quickly as possible. So you know, now that it's three equations, I'm not going to do the algebra in my head. I'll go through it step by step. So after, so whenever you do algebra, you should take some time to look at it. Try to sketch out a path that's going to be the quickest. So I stare at this for a while. I see that this has a lot of unknowns. I see these two both deal with only one unknown at a time. So hmm, if I solve this each for i1 and i2, and then plug it in here, then I'll get an expression for i that's going to be nice and clean. Uh, like it will be an expression for i that's not in terms of any other unknown. So let me solve this each for um, each of their unknowns. So that's the easy one. I'm going to do that in my head. I2 is, oh, wait, 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 sorry. I missed this. <laughs> um, it's OK, now that I realize it, let me change the step a little bit. I'm going to solve 2 for I2, plug that in here, and then solve the whole thing for I1. Then I'll have I1 to plug it in here, and I2 to plug in plug in here. Yeah. So I2, still simple. I2 is equal to V0 over R2. So I plug this in here to get the intermediate expression that uh, V0 over R2, V0 over R2 for I2 here times R2. Oh, wait, that's just the V0. Um, minus I1 
R1 is equal to 0. So um, these are to cancel out. So I get a nice simple expression for I1. I1 is going to be uh, V0 divided by R1. V0 over R1. All right, they all look simple. Um, I mean, I probably should have expected it because you know it, this is actually a simple circuit. I'm not supposed to get super complicated result. So let's plug this into the equation one and get an expression for i. The current i is equal to i1, oops, i1, v0 over r1 plus i2, v0 over r2, or I can factor out v0 and get v0 times 1 over r1 plus 1 over r2. So um, to find the equivalent resistance, I can plug this in here and solve for, e well, plug this in here. But let me actually re-express it in a way that's uh, more convenient because it keeps the expression simpler. So let me say, instead of trying to solve for our equivalent, let me say I want to instead solve for the, it's reciprocal, one over our equivalent. Okay, so if I'm doing that, then what I'm writing down here is I over V0. I over V0. This makes it simpler because I'm going to avoid the nested fractions this way. So um, I is just this V0 times 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 um, divided by V0. So V0 cancel. And you get this result, that 1 over the equivalent resistance is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. So that's the formula for adding resistors in parallel. Um, in shorthand, sometimes we say in parallel, resistors add in reciprocal. Yeah, there's one uh, useful, uh, yeah, there are things we can talk about here, but, um, but this is the formula and we just drive it. Um, the, I guess the most important to thing to know is this, and you can numerically verify this. This equivalent resistance is guaranteed to be smaller than either of these two resistors. It's always smaller than R1 or R2. Yeah. 